Welcome back to Beating a Dead Horse. As always, I am your host, Sean McKinda. And I am your host, Jackson Keller. I can tell that both of us wanted to do something with this intro, but neither of us knew what to do. We both thought about it. And we, we drew it out a little bit longer than we usually do. <laughs> and both of us came up with absolutely nothing. And both of us suffered for content. I thought about uh, singing Yankee Doodle and replacing it with my name, but that seemed too hard. <laughs> I, I was trying to come up with like a, a corporal or like captain or something like that. But like, oh, that would have been good. Th- there's not enough like of that in the movie, though. You know, like it, that could be referential to anything. It's not as... Is Independence Day focused? Yeah, yeah. Like, like this this movie's got military, but it's not like it's like GI Joe military. Yeah, it's not like if I was like I am Jaeger pilot Sean McKinda or something like that, which would be clearly referential to Pacific Rim. It would just been like I'm President Sean McKinda. There's not another <laughs> movie with a president in it. Hey, yuck. <laughs> um, we're, we're we're talking about Independence Day this week iconic landmark film unironically an iconic landmark film it, it genuinely is this is roland emmerich's masterpiece and that says a lot about a lot of things so uh, i mean i feel like asking whether or not you like independence day is entirely the wrong question <laughs> Um, I don't think it's possible to really dislike Independence Day. Well, it, that, it, it's funny you say that because this is a very divisive movie, actually. Um, like, like, okay, here's let me let me put it this way: I can see someone going into this like from like a critical consensus and being like, Independence Day is a bad movie. There are weird things that happen. It is kind of rife with character just dead ends, cul-de-sacs, plot developments that go nowhere, like strip contrivances yeah all that stuff absolutely true it's not it's not a good movie but it's a good movie guys yeah this is i mean i i i am delighted by independence day not always in the ways that it wants me to be delighted but oftentimes in the ways that it does it wears its heart on its sleeve it's big it's broad it's body it's dumb it's bold and brash it's bold and brash just like squidward tentacles but i think the more interesting question of of whether or not you like independence day is like what does the existence of independence day mean for the blockbuster because like i keep thinking about this every time i watch this movie which is now actually three times uh apparently this is one of the first movies i ever saw I was in diapers, as I learned, because I asked my, I asked, I, I asked my dear mother, guest on the show, Autumn Keller. Uh, she asked me what we were doing this week, and I'm like, "Oh, we're gonna do Independence Day." She's like, "Oh my god, like I love Independence Day. It's one of my favorite movies." Ah, and she informed me that this, this is actually this occasion that she's talking about is one of my earliest memories as a human being. I was like three years old, like barely out of diapers, like like a toddler, and we went up to a we went up to my crazy uncle's like mountain cabin where we watched independence day on a, on a VCR and a projector powered by like a gasoline generator. And because there wasn't any like electricity in this, you know, West Virginia cabin. And I don't remember anything about watching independence day. I do remember like falling on the floor and hitting my head. Okay. (laughs) That, that that makes me feel a little bit better. Cause what I was going to say is that, the only, like, I, I don't really remember a lot from early childhood. No one really does. But if your earliest memories are, like, watching Independence Day with your family, and maybe you don't really remember the movie, but you remember the things happening around it, I was going to feel really bad, because my earliest memory is me falling in a toilet and my parents laughing at me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm happy that you remember hitting your head, uh, because that at least at least makes me feel more normal than the weird outlier whose first memory is I wouldn't call it traumatic because I think it's fucking hilarious now, but very formative. 
<laughs> no, it's actually really funny because like I, the reason that I remember this is that I vividly remember my thought process at the time is that because we were visiting my great grandma uh, in Kentucky or West Virginia and we went up to this weird cabin that I'd never been to before and I didn't really understand like how or why we were going there, you know, because it was a dumbass little kid. And I had a really vivid, really realistic dream about my great grandma that night and I woke up it was pitch dark and I couldn't see anything like anything in my surroundings. And for a minute, I just had this thought like, oh, we I'm still at home in my re- in my real bed. Like I didn't actually go visit my grandma. And then I tumbled out of bed and like hit my head on this like hard, like w- rotted wooden floor. And I'm like, wait, no, that totally happened. What the fuck is going on? I'm three. Help. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so that's but anyways. Yeah, I only just connected those two things um, with Independence Day because my you know, that's what my mom said we did. And, you know, I'm going to I'm going to trust her judgment on that one. Um, uh, but yeah, so I didn't actually watch it again until much later, actually for a class, not for a Roland Emmerich class, as some of you might be disappointed to find out, just more about like the presentation of American identity in cinema. That was sort of the the theme. But like as a kid, I kind of feared this movie. I would always see it amongst our collection of like VHS tapes. And I thought it looked kind of cool, but also kind of scary. I probably subconsciously remembered watching it and like being like frightened by all the explosions because I was like, you know, three years old and still pissing my pants. And so I never watched it really as a kid, only watched it in college for a class where I had basically the same reaction that I have now um, and that I was thrilled and delighted and a little confused but mostly found what it says about like blockbuster movie making and its role in developing that genre for good or for ill really really interesting and you know we're gonna we're gonna get into that of course of absolutely course because that, that is if we're not here to talk about about movies not move not not about movies but about about movies what are we doing here that sentence makes sense, I promise. You just might need to think <laughs> about it a little bit harder than you're prepared to. If for comparison, though, to Jackson's I've seen it three times, this is my first time ever watching Independence Day. Uh, I had not seen it in any way, shape, or form before. I don't know how it had gone unseen. Uh, I might get a text from my dad if this goes up being like, Oh, you saw it way back when and you just don't remember it because that's entirely believable for me. Uh, but this is my first time watching Independence Day. I did really enjoy it. I thought it was goofy and weird and a lot of fun. It was a two and a half hour movie that went by faster than most of Hitchcock month. I call me trash if you want, because I am, it's (laughs) fine. I accept my role. Uh, but I think my biggest takeaway from this movie is that I had actually seen too much Roland Emmerich before watching Independence Day. And not that it diminished my enjoyment of Independence Day, but it diminished my holy shit, this is wacky and insaneness of Independence Day. Because for me, peak Roland Emmerich is going to be Eight-Legged Freaks. And he didn't direct it, but he's a, a producer on it. And you can feel Roland Emmerich throughout that movie just crawling around in it. Uh, I had also seen 2012 pretty much after it came out, and that movie blows hard. (laughs) 2012 fucking sucks. Uh, And then I'd seen The Day After Tomorrow relatively recently after that had come out too, and I remember liking that a lot as a kid, but I haven't watched it since. I can't imagine it holds up, but you know what? Knowing Roland Emmerich, I might still have a grand old time with it. Uh, outside of that, though, I picked up some of the other stuff. I saw the Patriot in social studies class, which, <laughs> uh, I mean, the public school system has some issues. Let's put it that way. Listen, speaking as a teacher, sometimes you just don't want to make a lesson plan and you need a smoke. All right? <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, so I, I think having seen all of those other Roland Emmerich movies or Roland Emmerich influenced movies kind of deadened the wackiness impact of Independence Day for me. Not Again, not to say that I didn't enjoy it. I, I enjoyed it quite a bit, but I didn't go away reeling from it in the way that some people are. Like the, the whole scene where the pod opens up and Will Smith punches an alien in the face seems absolutely fucking absurd. But 
I also my my favorite one of my favorite movies is genuinely Eight Legged Freaks. I I cannot tell whether it is earnest or tongue in cheek or what the fuck is going on with that movie, but I love it so goddamn much. And part of the reason I love it is because there are scenes like a man on a dirt bike going off a trick while a giant spider jumps, and the man does a fucking can can off his motorcycle, kicks the <laughs> spider away. It like cries and runs into a hole and he continues that is a scene (laughs) played totally straight faced in that movie and i love it and so to see will smith punch an alien was kind of like yeah all right moving on (laughs) i I, see i was i found independence day genuinely shocking (laughs) when i first watched it i got whiplash from quite a few scenes um in in a fun way but it was still Whiplash. Um, I'm so upset and- I didn't make us watch Eight Legged Freaks. I did not realize <laughs> how much that movie would factor into the discussion here. Because I think it, you, my friend, you do not understand Emmerich Whiplash until you watch Eight Legged Freaks. <laughs> that movie no. is so, so much. I, it's, I love it. Christ. I, if it's still on Netflix... Highly, highly recommended. Everyone goes and hunts it down. It is, it's like an hour and a half, and it is some of the most fun you will ever have watching a movie. And it is trash. Roland Emmerich, as a filmmaker, is like, I can't tell, like, who is the evil twin in this case. Like, who, like, but the, may, maybe there is no good and evil. Maybe they're just two sides of the same coin. But I imagine that, like, this is the self-actualized version of Michael Bay. Or, for, for a more simplistic take on that, Roland Emmerich's style is basically Steven Spielberg plus Michael Bay, and those are two very contradictory styles. And that what, is what makes... Eight, I'm going to just keep talking about Eight-Legged Freaks because I have so much more to say about Eight-Legged Freaks than I do about Independence Day. Because everything that Jackson can say about Independence Day, I feel like is even better epitomized in Eight-Legged Freaks. Because that movie is literally about a small town uniting together, hiding out in a failing mall, and fighting off fucking giant spiders. Up until the giant spiders part, that feels like a Spielberg movie. And you know what? The giant spiders don't feel too far off either. It, it's, it's, it's just bigger, more extreme. Like, the, everything's broader. Everything's, like, like it's, it's got that, those Spielbergian, like, stylistic trappings. Like, particularly Independence Day. But also, like, you know, this is a very long movie. So much of that is because there's so many plot elements. Like, so many characters. So many moving parts. So many fucking characters. Holy shit. Again... Not complaining. I don't think that any of the characters are particularly bad, but there are just so many of them. The I think the other interesting thing about this movie, and this movie in particular, probably more so than any other Roland Emmerich movie, mm-hmm. is that let's like, let's hear it. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe 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 you have uh, maybe Eight Legged Freaks also has this, but but I suspect not quite to the same degree. Is that like? In addition to just like earn the earnest Michael Bay vibe, Independence Day feels like like a turning point movie, like both the end of an era and the beginning of a new one in a lot of ways. Um, because this came out in 1996, you know, only a couple of years before 9/11. One of the last like big major movies that still talked about in like the the cultural consciousness before that time and. In a lot of ways, it's a really, really old-fashioned movie. Like it in terms of the plot, you know, there's a it, it's a big sprawling like epic in terms of scope, but the plot is very straightforward. Like you know, almost fifties level like sci-fi alien invasion movie. You know, there aren't really any twists or anything about the aliens. It's it's all just basically just like a B movie remade in a you know, at the time, modern, like, sensibility. I mean, even, Um, like, the romance subplots feel very 1950s in a lot of ways. Like, very, you know, just like, oh, they have to get together, they have to get married type of thing. Yeah, um, and, and then there's the, like, speaking of the characters, is that, like, none of the characters are, like, especially deep or even, like, 
or even memorable as characters because this is a movie with its characters that's so much more about star power like people don't remember you know david the programmer captain steven hiller they remember jeff goldblum and will smith and they're just doing their shtick they're doing their thing and it's great i love their shtick especially like like i wish they had more time in the movie together actually like their their stuff towards the end um and and they're kind of playing off each other as fun uh but yeah like that's very much an old hollywood mindset like after this like if you're thinking about other like early 2000s mid 90s or late 90s movies i mean that's like the start of x-men and spider-man and the rise of the superhero movie and the focus on the franchise and the pre-existing characters like it's it's a pretty well-established thing that like the hollywood megastar while they don't have it's not like they don't have any influence they don't sell movies the way that they used to like before if you put will smith in a movie everyone would see it just because it was will smith now although people still like will smith like having it in a movie doesn't guarantee you a hit what does guarantee you a hit is putting you know spider-man in your movie having like that pre-existing character and so that independence day is like you know an original story insofar as it's not a franchise movie at you know, coming into that era also is pretty notable, I think. Well, you know what? If you want to talk about star power, let's talk Eight-Legged Freaks, uh, <laughs> in which the top build cast is David Arquette. <laughs> Scarlett Johansson is also in it, but this was way before she was anything. <laughs> So, you know, that, that's, that's some star power right there. I don't even know who David Arquette is. <laughs> you took everything from me. I don't even know who you are. <laughs> no, I mean, y- you're right. Like, honestly, God, it feels like uh, Eight-Legged Freaks is almost, despite coming out several years after uh, Independence Day, it feels like Eight-Legged Freaks would be the build-up to Independence Day. Like, every bit of it kind of steps closer and closer to where Jackson is concluding. So I, I do have to concede that Independence Day is more in this regard. <laughs> and and I, I suspect more... Eight-Legged Freaks has David Arquette known, known for such movies as Scream 1, 2, 3, and 4 and Never Been Kissed. <laughs> Scream 4! I forgot they made a Scream 4! <laughs> oh, he's also in the... Prof- he was a professional wrestler for a little while. What an eclectic career for David Arquette. <laughs> oh, man. Anyways, um, because it's not, it's not just that Independence Day feels old-fashioned. Like, that wouldn't be super notable. But what is notable is that this feels like the beginning of... Of uh, like like I said, it's sort of a, the end of an era, beginning of a new one, like a linchpin, and that this is where we really start to see everything get super hyped up in terms of spectacle. So like I didn't do a ton of research. I wish I had done more, but just a cursory glance at some famous blockbusters from the eras before this, like 80s, early 90s. You have stuff like Star Wars. You have stuff like Indiana Jones. You have stuff like Back to the Future. You have stuff like Aliens. And I think the thing about those movies is that in terms of scope and in terms of scale, like, they're all pretty small, which seems weird to say about Star Wars because, you know, big galaxy-spanning adventure. But even Star Wars, like, you know, a planet gets blown up in that. But that planet only matters insofar as that Leia gives a shit about planet. Like, nobody gives a fuck about Alderaan for the rest of the series. Otherwise, the drama of Star Wars is so much more character driven. It's so much more about like, you know, the Leia Han romance, like the the Luke Vader legacy. And and in that regard, I think it fits in pretty well with the other movies that I mentioned that again were pretty small scale, like pretty character focused. Um and you know, a lot of that was probably just down to special effects, like, you know, as we have greater advances in special effects and CGI, you are able to do more big budget expansive things. Although it's notable that like so much i don't know about all the movie i'm I'm sure there's like some cgi but so one of the reasons this movie still looks really great and actually feels pretty modern is that the destruction sequences are still pretty fucking spectacular <laughs> do you know how they do most of them uh most of them were miniatures weren't they yes but do you know how they got the fighter crawl in that way no 
Uh, what they do is actually they build the miniature and then set them vertical because fire goes up. And so the, when all the fire is coming at you, it, it, fire doesn't naturally move in that way. And so what they actually did was filmed down on a vertical miniature with fire burning up it. Oh, that's so fucking cool. I love that. I love that. I don't know where I ever picked that up, but that is a little fact that I know about Independence Day and have known for most of my life, <laughs> despite having just watched Independence Day for the first time at 26. That is wild, but I love it. But I think that of the of like the famous 80s like iconic blockbuster, the biggest one in scope that's like comparable to something that we see now would probably be Ghostbusters, but Ghostbusters wasn't an action movie. Like, that was only big in scope for, like, a bit, basically. Like, you had the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man and stuff going on in New York. Whereas, like, this feels like the start of, you know, what we see with Transformers and and the MCU and Man of Steel, where you have these really... And, and those movies, it tends to be, like you know, the finales, but just in general, these really big, explosive action sequences. So it's... Dude, they fucking destroyed Chicago and, like, Transformers 3 had signs of it getting rebuilt all around Transformers 4 and then destroyed it again. <laughs> Chicago cannot get a break in the Transformers universe. <laughs> get fucked, Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> It sucks to be in the Midwest, dipshit. <laughs> <laughs> Got him. We're not in Ohio. Don't worry about it. No, uh, oh, God, oh, God, please don't come after me. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that that's just like the that that's what I find kind of the central tension of this movie. And maybe the central tension of Roland Emmerich as a filmmaker is that blurring of the line between like old school Hollywood showman and like new school visual effects like driven spectacle maestro. Well, I think it it's- changed if, if you allow me to just really quick interject with the quickest thing in the world by saying it changed from come see Thomas Cruise act in space to come see explosions all over the place. <laughs> I hate you so much. <laughs> um, but no, I mean no, that's 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 exactly right. That is true. I can't I can't deny the truth behind what you said, even if I can viciously condemn how it was said. <laughs> um, th- this movie, like, even I think that's when I say that the movie kind of gives me whiplash sometimes. That's that's kind of what I mean, and that like the introduction to the movie, it's very hokey, it's very broad, and like that's the mode of the writing that the characters are in. But like, I remember kind of like sitting up in my seat at the first destruction scene because they, they go out of their way. Like a lot of these movies, so like in, like in an Avengers movie, civilians will only get shown to show like them being protected because otherwise like internet people like us are going to criticize them for it. But in this like, they go out of their way to show a bunch of people being like, we love you, aliens! And, like, having sides, like, trying to, like, welcome them to Earth. Like, standing right under the giant big fuck Kamehameha laser and getting just obliterated. <laughs> like, there is no, there is no bones about it. <laughs> well, there's no bones in there either, though. Is the t- <laughs> but, I mean, like, even the, the, the friend reporter is, honest to God, Jeff Goldblum's career is pretty vague supposedly some sort of tv repair guy but clearly not that so whatever his his friend is shown for a while there and just gets fucking destroyed yeah (laughs) yeah he gets he gets taken out so hard with the rest of them which and then like this is the perfect example of the whiplash whiplash because famously in this scene there's there's a big schlock moment so you see will smith's girlfriend character well it's important before we get here you need to know, fire can't go around corners. <laughs> you know, just find yourself a chest high wall and crouch behind that shit like a Gears of War character, and you'll be all set. <laughs> so continue. I, I just felt like it was important to let that PSA out there to explain what happens next. So at this point, Will Smith's girlfriend character is like, uh oh, 
I think I feel like I'm forgetting something. And we see, oh no, the poor doggo. He didn't follow along. He's just sitting there being real nonchalant about all the things blowing up around him. She's like, doggo, come, come hither. And he like makes this graceful gazelle leap behind the corner that she's hiding behind as this wall of fire like rushes behind him but that's after we've seen people just like getting you know fucking incinerated um it's it's whiplash it's bizarre that's kind of what makes this movie so great though (laughs) yeah i mean the first like oh i don't even know as i said this movie went by really fast so i was not paying attention to like time scale but the first probably 30 40 minutes of it there are no real big explosions other than like a pilot dies exploring the the weird glowing orange orb in the middle of the storm clouds that never really gets touched on again huh i think that was supposed to be like the exhaust from however the ships move Sure. I'm, you know what? Sure. I'm, I'm not really going to think about it too much because I don't actually care. But it's just something that like stuck with me. It's like, a, huh, weird. Uh, but like outside of that, there's not really any explosions. No one really dies. And like for a while, if I hadn't known that it was Roland Emmerich and I hadn't seen, you know, the fire climbing through the buildings and whatnot, I wouldn't have expected it to go where it went because it felt very safe in the way that like, 80s movies do where everyone isn't going to get obliterated with a giant space laser i think i think that's what made made that moment so shocking for me and i even knew like you know famously this movie's promotional material like the white house gets blown up in the trailer but just like again the fact that it's so conventional by by the standards of its time and yet like you know so destructive like like I, that's what made me like sit back and go like whoa like hold on like like i is this the same movie and it is the same movie and i mean like i think it's interesting that you bring up that the explosions there isn't any like action or anything for the first like 40 minutes i think that kind of speaks to the ethos of roland emmerich and and maybe what his like strengths and his weaknesses as a filmmaker are because i feel like it's not so much that like i don't think roland emmerich is under any illusion that he's making like Citizen Kane here. But also, I think this is a man who just genuinely loves him as Schlock. <laughs> and Listen, I respect it. I respect the hell out of it. I, I, I respect it too, honestly. Like, like you know, it's uh, uh, the, Roland Emmerich's a man who likes himself a popcorn movie, and that's great. Um, but I think how this ends up manifesting in his scripts is that, like, if you look at the bones of it if you look at like the broad strokes of the movie like it's very well done like very well paced like the fact that we get that build up before the big release like not all filmmakers have that kind of restraint but it's it's the micro where like with like the character interactions just because everything everything is so broad like in a lot of ways we are sticking to the script of like what is supposed to happen in these character arcs so much that that's what makes the individual characters less memorable as characters and more as performers. And I think that's fine, but I also think that's why people, like, why he's such a divisive filmmaker, why some people really love Roland Emmerich movies and really love this movie in particular, and other people, like, can't stand them. Because, like, you know, the as far as what you need to have for an exciting action blockbuster, this has everything you want, except for those, like, smaller details. Perfect example of that. Uh, he... Are we doing spoilers at any point? Like, we're 30 minutes in here, and what I'm about to say is kind of spoilers. I mean, do we do we just want to call it spoilers from here? Yeah, we'll call it spoilers, and I'll talk about, like, the perfect example of where I went, wait, what the fuck happened here? So, before we do spoilers, if you're enjoying the podcast, review us on iTunes, tell your friends. It's the only way we grow, get bigger, anything like that. Follow us on Twitter at BADH Centercore Cast. Support us on Patreon at BADH Cast. Like, sub- comment, subscribe to Jackson's YouTube channel. That's Jackson Keller. Uh, I think that's it. Next week, we're going to be talking... We're going to be taking a a hard, hard left and talking about some Japanese generational drama called Tokyo Story. Unsurprisingly, this was Jackson's pick. I want to be a real weeb, senpai. (laughs) So we'll be doing that next week. For now, though, let's spoil some trash. (laughs) (laughs) So... (laughs) 
the the point where I went, what the fuck is going on, and really settled into the fact that these characters are just insanely broad and have no real autonomy. They go where the script tells them to go and do what the script tells them to say. When President Bill Pullman fired his defense general, general of defense, whatever the fuck his role is, defense attorney, man, I... I don't even know what that's called anymore. I think that's a, a condemnation. <laughs> I, th- I think he was supposed to be the secretary of that's defense. That's it. Secretary of <laughs> defense. That's the words I'm looking for. Look at that. We made it. Uh, so when he fires his secretary of defense, I was just kind of like, why though? Because he's, he's kind of built the secretary of defense up to be some sort of like skis ball scumbag. But the only thing that he did that was kind of skis ball scumbaggery was not tell them about the aliens but theoretically, they might not have realized that they're the same aliens. And so, like, maybe he didn't want to tell them. And, you know, plausible deniability, fine. The government being secretive, fine. Outside of that, the only thing he did wrong was be like, hey, I don't know that I totally agree with your plan of attack in this instance. And that seems to be the real issue with his Secretary of Defense, <laughs> is that he dared to give a dissenting opinion on what the president had to say. It, it- it actually makes me think that, like, I would love to see someone remake this movie, like, like make it identical, like, shot for shot, except that President Bill Pullman is Donald Trump, and once the aliens react, it becomes a completely different movie as he trumps it up. I mean, yes, absolutely, because <laughs> him firing his secretary of defense feels like the most Trump bullshit ever, <laughs> because it it's just because he goes against him a couple times, and honest to God... Listening to, like, watching what's happening with the plan of attack and hearing what his Secretary of Defense is saying, it all sounds fairly reasonable. Like, those (laughs) seem like logical conclusions. And sure, he's wrong a couple times, but that's purely due to script happening to the plot yeah it's it's funny because like as you were saying this i was just thinking that like ever everyone roasts the fuck out of the plan in this movie <laughs> like it's such a common like internet meme or at least it was I mean, like oh he used a macbook to upload a virus to the aliens um like everyone roasts that in real life so it's even funnier that the only character who raises these same concerns is like, pish posh, away with you. <laughs> and I mean, like, here's the thing. I don't even care that the plan is fucking absurd. How did he hack into the, the, the spaceship? <laughs> who knows? Who cares? I, 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 To be clear, I don't actually give a shit either, but I just found that amusing. No, it, it really is. And, like, I, that, that's the point, though, is, like, that character... And that interaction and everything up to that point is so fucking broad and makes no goddamn sense in the context of everything else happening. But, like, who cares? Just have a good time and go along with it. Shut up, sit down, and watch watch aliens blow up and Will Smith punch them in the face. We, we are not here to, to feel enlightened by our intelligence. We are here to have Will Smith welcome an alien to Earth with his fists... We are here to watch President I'm Bill sorry. Pullman. Him welcome an alien home with his fists and then say another one-liner afterwards because that one, <laughs> the first one might not have been good enough. We have to have a couple in the chamber in case, you know, like got to drop the one-liner and be like, mm, that one might not have stuck. Maybe a second one will be the one that will do it. It makes more sense in this context, but when Will Smith said something about, like, I want to go up there and kick E.T.'s ass, and he made that little quip, I couldn't help but think of Bright, where where, where he calls an, an orc, like, a Shrek-looking motherfucker. <laughs> 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 like, I just made that connection. I wanted everyone to know that. <laughs> Also, real talk. Uh, Will Smith's buddy, who kept calling him Big Daddy, was really hot for him, right? Yes, I. I mean, do do we do we want to go into this? <laughs> I mean, I I think I'm going to for a minute here because he was clearly trying to get him to break off with his girlfriend, and the only reason I can think of that is because he he wants some of that Will Smith, Will Dick. I I'm impressed at how nothing that was. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the depths at which that was an anti bit astound even me. Well, listen, what I was saying up until Will Dick, I do stand by. <laughs> yeah. The Will Dick thing, um, 
this is just an episode where we're going at things, specifically me, and hoping that they stick the landing. And you know what? <laughs> My record on this episode has been about 50-50. That, that thing way back when, when I did like the come see Will Smith in space bullshit, the rhyme was an accident. But I fucking rolled with it. This... <laughs> This was my penance, all right? This was my monkey's paw <laughs> deal. I got a good one, and then I had to say Will Dick like it was anything. I set aside Will Dick for now and forever. <laughs> um, I, I do think that, like, you, you, could, you could probably have a field day, and I, I'm sure people have if you... Are like a are, are are like a queer theorist, like like not necessarily just like a theorist who is queer, but like who specializes in like queer queer literary theory. Because this movie, we 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 were talking about it a little bit in in the pre discussion, um, and that how it's such a like macho movie that it's 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 kind of a shock that Roland Emmerich is openly gay. And like I had known that before I had watched it, but even watching it, I'm like, oh man, there are like some jokes in this that like if I didn't know Roland Emmerich was gay, I'd be like, oof, like I don't know, buddy, I don't know if you should be doing that one. Like pretty, pretty par for the course, like '90s stuff. Oh yeah, there this movie, I I we were talking about it, and Jackson's like, oh, he made a Stonewall movie, and I'm just like, oof. I, I didn't know Roland Emmerich was gay, and I just assumed that like somebody paid a straight man to make a Stonewall movie. And I was shocked. And then I looked him up and like, he's open again. Okay, yeah, that makes a lot more sense now. But like watching just what I've seen of Roland Emmerich's work, like it, it feels like absolute peak macho bro movie. Like, yeah, man, no homo. Am I right? So, yeah, I was, I was genuinely shocked to learn that Roland Emmerich was gay. Yeah, but then, but then like on the other hand, it's it. Like it does make some kind of sense. Like I don't know about this movie, the the whole history of like Roland Emmerich and like where he was at in his personal life, or like if if he was out or anything like that. I mean, I, 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 I'm guessing that like he he probably was not out because it was the 90s. That's just my guess, which is why maybe there's a bit of that like gay panic joke kind of stuff in here. As far as like his attitude, I think that like yeah, it's something. It's something that feels a little strange just because of those, like, Michael Bay, like, macho bro elements. But it's, I think, unlike Michael Bay, like, the fact that there is... It, it, do, it does make a little bit... It does make a little bit more sense. Like, there are some really... Some really sincere elements and some really, like, progressive elements. Like, Roland Emmerich is definitely what the kids on 4chan these days call a big lib cuck. If that wasn't obvious uh, from, you know, the day after tomorrow being a climate disaster movie from Stonewall being a gay rights movie like like he often puts these very overt political themes into his movies not so much in this one the uh the the politics are like third grader like I pledge allegiance to the flag <laughs> kind of politics that that's being honestly a little generous this honest to god just feels like I was born in America and so I want America to win I'm in preschool and I shoot <laughs> guns at alien pew pew pew. Like th as much it, this is a movie that feels like being called Independence Day, being set in America, being, you know, entirely structured from the American perspective, feels like it could be very jingoistic and patriotic and all that good shit, and it's really really not. It's just kind of there because it's there. You know, President Pullman gives a speech, and he's the president. Although, yeah, you know, I did notice it while, while we're talking about the subject. I think if we're weighing the two things as far as, like, how surprising is it that Roland Emmerich is, like, an openly gay filmmaker just looking at this film. On the one hand, I was about to mention some of the more, like, progressive elements, like, especially for 1996. Like, the fact that, um, it, you know, you had mentioned this in a pre-discussion, the fact that Will Smith's, Will Smith's girlfriend is a stripper and that's not really ever played for laughs or as like a joke like it's just treated as like honest work and that. she is incredibly competent throughout the rest of it like we, I was watching this with Sam and he, Sam was really the one who brought it up because originally I had bad an eye and I'm like okay I'm watching a 90s movie her being a stripper just feels whatever 90s were stupid around a lot of things uh, and then the longer it went on Sam's like but why is she a stripper I'm like I don't 
I don't have an answer for you because everything she is doing, she is doing it like incredibly competently. And so her being a stripper doesn't feel like the butt of a joke anymore. It just feels like something they did and is very in a kind of a backdoor way pro sex worker, which retweet great i'm thrilled that you put this in here roland and just you're like she's a sex worker i make good money at it i like doing it i'm good at it and look at that i'm still good at everything else and it doesn't make me anything less of a human wonderful and makes more sense knowing that he is an openly gay man yeah i mean just because like yeah you know that that's a that's a bigger talking point for a, like in lgbt community like circles like that decriminalizing sex work because that plays into systems of oppression and like sexual violence and all that stuff that's you know considered a very important part of uh the struggle and the theory and all that stuff so that tracks also decriminalize sex work just also also yes okay in case that wasn't clear um you know I'm, i'm saying all these things as a positive thing in independence day's favor on the other hand though uh, what goes more along into the Michael Bay side of things is that, like, and 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 and, and it, this is probably the closest thing we have to like a political angle in Independence Day that feels. I'll admit that this is the reason I was thinking about Trump is that like it feels a little uncomfortable in in this context that the President Bill Pullman's character arc is basically like. No, oh, you know, all the American people think I'm a pencil pushing like bureaucrat cuck who's lost my edge. I need to like have a beer with the boys. I gotta be George Bush, the Bush, the president. You can have a beer with and like hop in my fighter pilot jet and be a manly man again. Um, like that stuff. That stuff wasn't my favorite. <laughs> well, I was thinking a lot about that and trying to kind of contextualize it with the time period because yeah, I, I was also in the same boat. But I was trying to be like, all right, so are they trying to imply you know he's liberal, Democrat, Republican, what what have you? You know, like where is he falling on this political spectrum? And it's never really fully addressed. But I think it's important to keep in mind that this was during the Clinton era. And also that there is a joke about him having an affair. And I think that that might kind of tip the scales in one way, right? Like it kind of yeah. puts it a little yeah. bit more in context of him being a Bill Clinton stand-in, which that's about all I can offer on that. I don't know enough about Bill Clinton as a politician other than he has some very bad things in his personal life. But as far as his policies go, I don't know. I I also know that he was pretty bad about criminal justice reform. Um, That didn't really play into this movie either. I'm just kind (laughs) of going going down my list of things I've watched recently and things I've learned about previous presidents. Uh, So, yeah, I mean, I just I didn't want to generalize and be like, Bill Clinton was great because he wasn't. But, you know, it's neither here nor there. Well, I I, I think that. The individual policies, again, because this the, the politics of this movie are, like, G.I. Joe third grade level, right? Um, like, so that, the ins and outs of that um, aren't as important. I, th- I think it is, like, it is another relic of, of the era, though, in that I think, I, I could be wrong, but I think that one prominent way that Bill Clinton kind of sold himself when he was trying to get elected was as kind of a relatable, like, good old boy, every man, like, he's, you know, like, the meme that became famous through George Bush, I feel like kind of started with, like, you know, Bill Clinton, like, hey, I'm just, it's just like, uh, I'm just like you, you know, I'm from, like, uh, Arkansas or Nebraska or wherever the fuck he's from, and, like, you know, I got, like, kind of a southern accent, and, you know, I'm playing up my, you know, everyday man self. I play saxophone and kind of vaguely remind Sean of Sonic the Hedgehog for some reason. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Like, that definitely was part of the, like, image that he cultivated. And so, like, that, this feels... Like, these elements of that, like, that Clinton-era stuff, because you're right, it is very Clinton-era, um, that feels sort of like like seeing the Twin Towers on fire in this movie. Like, not something that probably anyone would have made super note of at the time, but is kind of like, you know, tug at the shirt collar in hindsight, precisely because we've seen how much, like, we, we want a president just like everyone else rhetoric has led us to a couple times now (laughs) it ain't great guys it ain't great vote for someone smarter than you god damn it (laughs) 
<laughs> oh boy, howdy. Um, what else do we want to talk about with Independence Day? We, we've kind of covered some of the politics of it, which of which there are um, crumbs. <laughs> Phew. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, especially because, like, if we're talking about the American exceptionalism angle, um, it, re- it the reason I say, like, third grader stuff is it, 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 it has also been memed to oblivion when, like, the British guys are like, tally-ho, the Americans are coming to save us. We're joining the offensive. Like that, like that part. <laughs> it honestly reminds me of the Lego movie when Unikitty goes, numbers, 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 business. Is this working to blend in? It, it, basically, you could replace that with British, 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 British. Is this working? And people said, yeah, I know we get it. They're British. And then they moved on. That's the fact that they didn't go like, ah, yes, the Americans have interrupted our tea time to mention. <laughs> no, yeah. And like, I mean, this is also interesting because Roland Emmerich is German, I think. Uh, um, I believe so, yes. Yeah. The movie, like, very, again, very nakedly on the surface, like, you know, this is our Independence Day, but also, like, the whole point of that speech is, like, you know, this is not just America's Independence Day, this is the world's Independence Day, which, of course, like, given given the like association with American Americana and that, and that sort of stuff is still very much like American exceptionalism, like centering that sort of thing. But again, it's in such like a dopey, like third grader way that it's hardly worth mentioning. I feel like it's kind of honestly like the good, the bad and the ugly where there was some understanding of what American exceptionalism was and like what that whole thing was, but with the good, bad and the ugly came out a little bit, uglier pun not intended when it was the civil war and they're like oh you know the south we're just the south and everyone's the same in war one side isn't fighting for slavery (laughs) uh whereas in this like i think that distance kind of creates a weird feeling because it doesn't have that american exceptionalism outside of that third grade level much like the good the bad the ugly had a third grade level understanding no had less than a third grade level understanding of the civil war the Third graders know that the Civil War was about <laughs> slavery. <laughs> well, depending on where they grew up, they do. <laughs> Again, like, it's just so broad. And and I think this is the thing about Roland Emmerich in general. And what I find interesting about him, fascinating about him, is that he's a man who loves his schlock. But he's also very clearly a man who does care about his politics. Like, so many of his films are overtly, like political and overtly like liberal like Roland Emmerich is like peak Hollywood liberal like he loves him his his uh you know messages that fit kind of snugly with like the the mainstream Democratic Party but the fact that the movies themselves are so schlocky it's 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 hard to it's hard to really engage with them on that level because they are like first and foremost meant to just entertain and they're very good at that or at least this one is <laughs> um. i mean honestly there, there's something to be said for that though because i i do think that basically any sort of political influences come in small steps like i, I remember watching a video i believe from innuendo studios talking about how like people become radicalized and it's not like somebody goes from you know middle of the road independent to oh you know i am full alt-right nazi scum uh it's more slow steps and like that's how you get into conspiracy too because you start off saying like oh you know i believe that the earth is flat and then slowly but surely you start to fall into deeper and deeper conspiracies as some make become more and more acceptable like there's something to be said for really broad general Hollywood liberalism because the day after tomorrow might be like the first step for somebody to be like, Hmm, is this what the world's going to look like? And they do a little research and they go, okay, maybe not that, but you know what? Maybe the world could be improved somewhat. And that's not a bad thing. There is something to be said that with the day after tomorrow in particular, like my family loved that movie. I didn't, I was too scared to watch it because you know, ice, ice death and climate change. I think the movie worked a little too well on my young mind. Like, oh, this is what's going to happen to the planet? That's really fucking scary. I'm going to go hide under a blanket. <laughs> um, See, I did that with Godzilla, and so I don't know. <laughs> I'm not really <laughs> worried that we're going to get godzilla <laughs> The After Tomorrow, like, came out at, like, the perfect time, because I was old enough to, like, 
Uh, that would like we, we looked at it last time. We we were in like fourth grade when that came out, so I was old enough to like understand the world a little bit and understand that like the end of the world was like a thing that could happen. But I also was still young enough that the fact that as a kid I was such a baby like beta bitch boy that was me. I'd like hide under the covers. Like I refused to watch Jurassic Park even though I loved dinosaurs because it was too scary. I think I said that last week too, but it bears reiterating. Like I was scared of everything. So that was like the perfect store movie of like here is a real world scary thing and also maybe some like loud noises that'll make you cover your ears because poor Wimpy Jackson can handle it. (laughs) Yo, shout out though. This movie had a really good fucking jump scare in it. When the when the skeleton the the exoskeleton popped open, yeah, Sam and I both jumped at that. Like that was a genuinely good jump scare. I was not like I it, part of me kind of knew it was coming, but it was still surprising enough. I'm like, Ugh. and I was like, you know what? Props, absolutely. I'm not normally a jump scare guy, but that one that one felt earned. Nice work, movie. Nice work. I also I, I guess if I'm just talking about a random thing the something about the the dad character's delivery when he's when he's giving like a motivational speech about all you need is love and he's like john lennon said that got shot in the head very sad like something <laughs> about that why it makes me laugh really hard it did when i first saw it and i forgot about it and when it happened again i cracked up so <laughs> there are some like genuinely good lines and some good ideas in this movie it's just surrounded by schlock and that doesn't make it worse it just makes it schlock and schlock is wonderful. What what can I say? This July 4th, just sit back, relax. You know, there aren't no fireworks because we're all going to die of coronavirus. Um, and, you know, watch explosions of famous landmarks like the Empire State Building from the comfort of your digital screens with Independence Day and revel in destruction and cackle at, at memes. Yeah. I mean, honestly, hard retweet. It was a great movie. I really enjoyed it. Uh, And it's probably something that I will watch again at some point when I'm just looking for something dumb and schlocky to put on the TV because I'm always looking for just something dumb and schlocky to put on the TV. To give give my dear mother another shout out, she ha- said when I, when I was talking about this movie that this is a, one of her movies that she will always watch when it's on cable and like fall asleep to, which is I mean like it says it all I think. <laughs> it really does. Yeah, I mean I can totally see why too. I you put it on, it doesn't matter where it is. You know what's going on. It's just aliens fighting humans. What more do you want? We should talk about cowboys and aliens. I have never seen that movie, although I really wanted to back when it came out. I remember liking it when it came out, and I can't imagine it's still good, right? <sighs> I, I'd i be curious. <laughs> Just something for the back burner. I've been Sean McKinda. Find me on Twitter at Sean underscore McKinda. Find my writing over at 25yearslatersite.com, including, including a piece about Eight-Legged Freaks, a movie that I still don't know that I fully understand, but I love it so (laughs) fucking much. And I'm Jackson Keller. You can find me... (sighs) You can find me on Twitter at Jackson J. Keller, or you can find me in a back alley and use a gun to put me out of my misery. That'll work too, because fuck Twitter. I can't believe you're back on Twitter. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. (laughs) You know, it's, it's actually going... My, my, my Twitter usage is smarter this time. Instead of, like, following a bunch of, like, ind- individual people who make me mad, I mostly see, like, quick, dry blurb headlines and, like, fan art of mostly waifus, TV- TBH. It's a good system. <laughs> and you get retweeted by a nutshack bot. So, I mean, it, it can't be any worse. <laughs> So I mean, we're off to we're off to a better start. But you know, you can find me on Twitter. You can you know you can retweet my nut check me, <laughs> and you can also go to my YouTube. Uh, if you're not already there, like, comment, subscribe. I'm putting out more content that's not just the horse cast pretty soon. I'm going to talk about ukulele, a garbage video game. (laughs) So look forward to that. I'm very excited for this video. I've been talking with him about it on and off for a week and a half now, and I'm very curious to see where it ends up. So... 
definitely watch his stuff. If you want to get in contact with the podcast, follow us on Twitter at B8AgentsCoreCast. It just basically lets you know when we go live. If you have any questions or something like that, I guess you can tweet at us. But, like, broad stuff. Because if you want to talk to Jackson and I directly, the best way to do that is on our Discord. And you can only get access to our Discord by signing up at our Patreon. That's patreon.com slash B8AGHCast. At only a dollar a month, that's our Discord. Yell at us directly. At $5 a month, you get access to our Discord and our backlog of bonus episodes, including an episode that we just released all about Death of the Author, J.K. Rowling, and you? Yes, you. We, we talk a little bit about like what you should do in these situations because it's, it's all interesting. $10 a month gets you access to all that stuff and the ability to be like, hey, you fuckers should watch Eight-Legged Freaks. Uh, and we'll watch Eight-Legged Freaks. Please, someone recommend that. I want to make Jackson watch <laughs> Eight-Legged Freaks so bad. I will talk about Eight-Legged Freaks until I die. Uh, so yeah, you should do that. It also gets a little something something. Thank you so much, Julia, Travis, Pat, Mom, Aunt Summer. Y'all are great. This 4th of July, we're going to set off fireworks in your name, except we, we don't have the budget for that, so more people have to donate to get fireworks budget. <laughs> for just us, because this is an audio medium. I mean, I could pop, pop, <laughs> That's more like a laser, I guess. Enjoy your fireworks. That was... There's the, there's the other monkey's paw, man. There it was. I made a well, joke before that landed. I had to do one that didn't. Well, that one, that, I, I was responsible for that one, so... That's true. Oh, no. What's coming for me? Find out next week. <laughs> Thanks, Lord, to hire the use of our theme song is Suicide Alternate Takeoff. They have high acting low expectations. They're wonderful bad. You go check them out however you can. Stream them, buy their music, whatever you gotta do. Also, thanks to 25 years later, site.com. There's a little button of us in the corner of their website that you can click on, but you should also see what other people are writing about. There's a bunch of really talented people doing a bunch of really talented writing. I've got a piece coming out about horror in like two weeks, so stay tuned for that. I'm very excited about it. Uh, other than that, next week, Tokyo Story. Hard left turn. Very different from what we're talking about this week. I love sad generational dramas and Japan, so I'm excited. <laughs> I am less into both of those things than Jackson, so we'll see what happens. Bye! Don't you go.